In this introductory video for Chapter 9, we will be talking about gene expression and its importance in development in cancer. By the end of this video, you should be able to define gene expression as well as to articulate its importance in various physiological processes. So first, just to review, we've been learning about the central dogma of molecular biology in which DNA is used to make RNA via the process of transcription and RNA is used to make protein via the process of translation. So our major question now is, what is gene expression? And gene expression can be defined as production of an RNA and that RNA may or may not be translated into a protein from the DNA that encodes it. So basically, gene expression is when a DNA is expressed by being produced into an RNA, which can then lead to production of a protein. It's important to note that not all RNAs are converted into proteins. For example, tRNAs and rRNAs are the final product. So production of RNA itself can be considered gene expression or production of protein via the mRNA. So gene expression can be high, so increased gene expression would lead to production of more RNA and potentially more protein or decreases in gene expression would lead to production of smaller amounts of RNA and protein. So really the focus of this chapter is going to be how do we regulate gene expression? How do we turn it up and increase the amount of RNA or protein we produce? And how do we turn it down and how do we decrease the amount of RNA or protein we produce? I want to talk a little bit about why that's so important. So one of the major functions for gene expression is to determine cell fate. So as you know, we have a sperm and an unfertilized egg that will come together to form the zygote, which is the fertilized egg. So this fertilized egg or zygote will eventually split into two separate cells and at the very earliest stage we already have differential gene expression in those two cells and that's because there are different cytoplasmic determinants that are split between the two cells and this can become very important for development of the body axes and for the cellular movements that are going to form the later tissue types. So for example, there has to be differential gene expression in the early embryo because nearby cells can send signals to adjacent cells that lead to very important processes such as gastrulation in which we form the three germ layers, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. Now this is also very important in cellular differentiation. Cellular differentiation is when different cells are induced to have very specific functions. So as you know, an embryonic stem cell is a pluripotent cell. So this is a cell that has the potential to become all kinds of cells. However, if we're talking about, in this case, development of the muscle, that embryonic stem cell has to give rise to a cell that is a myoblast, and that myoblast has to give rise to a cell that will become part of a muscle fiber. This is a fully differentiated cell because it's reached its final specific function. But if you remember, all of these cells have exactly the same DNA. So somehow we have to express different genes from the same DNA to go all the way from this pluripotent embryonic stem cell to this differentiated cell that is a part of a muscle fiber. And how that happens is through the um, work of proteins called transcription factors. So here we see a master regulatory gene called MyoD. In our myoblast, the cell that is determined that it will eventually give rise to a muscle cell, that MyoD protein is expressed. And MyoD is very important because it is a transcription factor. And a transcription factor is a protein that helps to activate transcription of a very specific subset of genes. So here, MyoD can bind 
the promoters of muscle specific genes that will then lead to production of these genes. And as you remember in the last chapter we learned that transcription factors help RNA polymerase and in particular they help RNA polymerase to transcribe specific genes. So here you can see that MyoD can drive expression of another transcription factor so we have a cascade effect here and then that transcription transcription factor drives expression of these muscle specific proteins like myosin, like actin, and other cell cycle proteins that are very important for the muscle. So this is one way in which gene expression is very important is it allows cells to develop very specific functions and to differentiate into specific cell types. Now in addition, I mentioned before that control of gene expression is very important for axis development. So here's a very good example of this. So this is in a Drosophila embryo. So as you probably know, Drosophila is a common fruit fly. And Drosophila embryos express a protein, express an mRNA and a protein called bicoid. And bicoid is a very interesting protein because bicoid is specifically expressed in the anterior end of the embryo and then its expression drives formation of the head structures. So in this embryo we can see that the bicoid expression will drive formation of the anterior structures, the head structures of the embryo. Now what's really interesting is if we develop a fruit fly embryo where we have knocked out bicoid, so there's no bicoid expression at all within that embryo, that embryo will in fact develop two tail structures and no head structures. So bicoid drives expression of all of the genes that are required to develop the head structures in the embryo. Changes in gene expression are also really, really important to understand because changes in gene expression can lead to cancer. And as we know, cancer is a disease that's caused by an accumulation of mutations. But mutations can have two very different effects. So if we're de um, Mutations, they will all lead to increased cell division, which leads to tumor development and to cancer, but this can occur in two ways. This could be because a protein becomes overexpressed, so this is a protein that you've turned on when it's not supposed to, or perhaps you've expressed it in a cell where it's not supposed to be expressed, or maybe you've just expressed too much of it. And in this case, the cell cycle becomes overstimulated, and the cells will begin dividing and continue dividing without stopping leading to tumor formation. This type of gene that when it is turned on either in the wrong place or to too high of a degree that that causes cancer is called an oncogene. But there's another change in gene expression that can also cause cancer. In some cases, when one lacks a very specific protein or a specific RNA, this can lead to a lack of inhibition of the cell cycle. So this is a protein that when it's absent or deleted or not expressed, this causes cancer. This type of gene is called a tumor suppressor because under normal conditions it's suppressing a tumor from forming so when it's lost it leads to cancer. And let's talk about a couple of ways that an oncogene could be turned on. So how can we change expression of that oncogene to cause cancer? So first, we have a proto-oncogene that it's in its normal state, it's in your genome, it won't cause cancer. However, in some cases, that gene could be moved next to the wrong promoter. And as you remember, the promoter is ultimately what controls transcription of the gene. So if that oncogene is moved next to a promoter that turns it on at the wrong time or in the wrong cell type, this can lead to um, accelerated growth because the protein is produced in excess. This is actually a very common cause of leukemia. 
In addition, oncogenes can also be turned on by gene amplification. So this is when we have multiple, a gene is duplicated, so we have, end up with multiple copies of a gene, which leads to excess expression of that protein, which can cause the cellular growth to be stimulated. And most commonly within cancer, we've um, accumulated some kind of point mutation. And this point mutation can accelerate expression of the gene um, in a couple of different ways. So first, that point mutation could affect a control element, could affect that promoter or some kind of upstream regula or downstream regulatory element that leads to excessive production of that protein, which can cause cancer. Or alternatively, that mutation could also be within the gene and it could either do something to the protein that activates it or it could keep that protein from being degraded so that we accumulate too much of it and in that way we can also um, have an oncogene become activated. But all of these methods have changed the expression of the protein um, that have ultimately turned that oncogene on. So as you can imagine, your body has to very carefully control expression of these oncogenes because they're all present as proto-oncogenes within our genome. So our body has to carefully control that expression in order for us to not develop cancer. And this is an example of that. So here, the RAS oncogene is one of the most common oncogenes, um, most commonly mutated oncogenes in human cancer. This is a gene that is part of a signaling pathway that we'll learn about in a future chapter. But when that RAS oncogene is, becomes hyperactive, either because it's overexpressed or it's mutated, that leads to excessive growth of the cell because it ultimately drives activation of a transcription factor that stimulates cell division, that stimulates cell growth. However, it's important to note that cancer isn't always caused by genes being turned on. Cancer can also be caused by genes being turned off when they're not supposed to be turned off. So P53 is an example of a tumor suppressor. So P53 is a gene that, remember, you're constantly being exposed to different types of mutagens that can cause DNA damage. So for example, UV light we know can cause DNA damage, and if that damage is not repaired, it can lead to mutation. Your cells luckily have a response system where they recognize that damage and P53 becomes active as a part of a signaling pathway that then pauses the cell cycle so that our nucleotide excision repair in this case can repair the damage. However, in the absence of P53, P53 does not pause, allow the cell cycle to be paused, and then the damage can't be repaired, which can lead to accumulated mutations. Because of this, P53 is actually the most common mutation that occurs in cases of skin cancer. And this, in these cases, um, the P53 gene is mutated or lost, or its expression is turned off, making it a tumor suppressor. So... That's the end of that video. Thank you.